Martins was a student who learned to participation um, working with Bill. Um, Bill often talks about this legendary Kepler seminar in which I don't remember how many students there were, but every three philosophy and, and one right. uh, astronomy teacher from uh, right. And all the and all the papers from that course turned into uh, um, published papers and the three um, philosophy. Or three philosophy <laughs> papers, and um, Rhonda's work in that course eventually culminated in her book. And um, then, even though her um, title on the program has to do with Kepler, and she's not going to be talking about Kepler today. The actual title of the talk is Use Fertility. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Rhonda. Thank you, Mike.
Now that's not the case under the Copernican system because uh, the motion of the Earth relative to the motion of the other planets is the cause of the retrograde motions. And so you have these relationships between the motion of the Earth and the retrogressions. Uh, this, these relationships are what uh, Bill often refers to as systematic dependencies. So um, if we go and we use the motion of Mars to make measurements of the Earth's orbit, uh, that will then put constraints on um, what our measurements of, say, the, the retrogression of Saturn is supposed to be. So theory is going to place constraints on that. Now, one of the things that this got me interested in was in the structure of theories, or how theories hang together, to speak a little bit more loosely. Um, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to give a defense, by the way, of the evidential significance of systematic dependencies. I'm just going to assume it because I think it's obvious, obviously right. Um, I'm going to assume it for the purpose of this talk. Instead, I want to talk about another structural aspect of theories, mainly a structural aspect that allows for a theory's extendability or its fertility. So here's a, a brief outline of the talk. I'm going to be talking about McMullen's notion of eufertility, and also his notion of efertility, to be defined shortly if you're not already familiar. Um, I picked McMullen because the, there's not a whole lot of literature in the philosophy of science on fertility. It gets mentioned frequently as a virtue of theories, but um, not a whole lot of, um, of work being done on trying to make this notion precise. Uh, McMullen's is a, one of the seminal articles on this, and pretty much every other article on fertility <coughs> mentions McMullen's notion. Now, McMullen's uh, idea of fertility depends pretty crucially on the metaphors and analogies that occur within a theory. And so after that, I'm going to be talking about um, the nature of metaphors and the nature of analogies and some attempts that have been done in the, the cognitive sciences to go and model uh, metaphorical and analogical reasoning. Now, there are quite a few attempts, and they're all different, and we learn different things from them. I've chosen James Martin's uh, minus model and also Gentner's um, SME model. Uh, of course, these are all acronyms. Uh, my choice, my reasons for choosing this model over that model just has everything to do with time, and my reason for choosing those models rather than some others, well, they're actually rather idiosyncratic. Um, I chose Gentner's model because it actually just helps me set up a point that I want to make at the end of the talk. But I could have chosen other models and we would have learned different things from choosing those other models. So I want to, I want to make sure that you're aware that this is just a poor example. And of course, once we finish that, we'll talk about the implications, what we learned, and since um, we're philosophers of science, or we're interested in philosophy of science, we of course have to talk about some of the modern issues involved. So that is a very brief outline. So on to the Collins notion of fertility. This wouldn't be a philosophy talk if you didn't draw a distinction, or two, or five. So we're going to start with the first one, and this is the distinction between p-fertility and u-fertility. The p in p-fertility stands for proven fertility, and so the u stands for unproven fertility. Now, McMullen's notion of fertility is um, something that applies to a theory as it changes over time. It's not a property that, that, a, that a theory has just take a snapshot of it at a particular point in time. So it's an evolutionary notion. And a theory, when it is born, um, will be mostly u-fertile. Um, and a theory, as it matures, will become more and more p-fertile, where um, a theory is p-fertile if the various modifications and extensions of it um, end up being tested successful. Well, it's t tested and then found to be successful. Right, so there's a successful test, and then the theory itself was successful. Now, um, if we're interested in confirmation theory, then McMullen says we're going to be more interested in p-fertility than u-fertility, because u-fertile um, theories do not, well, their epistemic status is unknown. So uh, my apologies on the handout, if you're preferring to use the handout for reading quotations, this is actually the last McMullen quote because I made some very last minute changes to talk. The rest of it is all in order. To say that a theory has a high degree of heuristic potential for youth fertility tells us nothing of its epistemic status. In 
indeed, the greater is your sick potential, the more problematic its present epistemic status may well be, since it contains so much, by the way, of untested suggestion. Okay, now, eufertility is still important, however, because in order to make the claim that we have to look at um, the historical path that a theory takes, uh, McMullen needs to say something about how the p-fertile theory is related to the infertile theory. Uh, if he doesn't do that, then we can often, then we could say something like uh, the value of the p-fertile theory um, just is decomposable into other epistemic values like its predictive accuracy and so on or simplicity. Okay, so we need to talk about the transition and how that occurs between new fertility and p-fertility. And McMullen doesn't give us a set of necessary and sufficient conditions or anything like that, so I'm just going to give you a whole bunch of quotes just so that you can get a feel for what he has in mind. So, the first one. Okay, the development of the original theory is not just an exploration of its logical implications. Rather, it is a matter of analogy, of tentative suggestion, of plausible modification in light of a particular opportunity for expansion or in the face of a troublesome anomaly. The development is natural in the sense that it is shaped by the structures of the theory, but not so natural as to be rule governed. <coughs> there is a need for a creative act of imagination, a what if, in which the resources of the theory are exploited to construct a new possibility, which on testing proves to be a fruitful insight. Okay, so again, just to emphasize, we have uh, in not being rule governed. I don't know exactly what he means by this. Um, so we'll just leave that open for the time being. I'm going to suggest that there's a sense of later, that there's a sense in which uh, there are rules that govern it, although they may not be the kind of rules that he has in mind. Uh, in particular, just to give you a, a sense, um, they may not be rules that are sufficient to um, force a unique modification. In other words, the theory has to extend in this direction and not in some other. But it doesn't necessarily mean that there's there no rules at all. Okay, next quotation. Now, the resources of the theory are evidently of two sorts, the implications derivable from it by means of formal rules, and the resources it displays as a metaphor i.e. as a tentative conceptual juxtaposition of elements capable of suggesting to the creative mind a whole range of possible further developments of a theory itself. These metaphors suggest modifications that are plausible extensions and the experienced scientist will have a certain feel for considerations such as these. The theory directs the mind not coercively, but tentatively by analogies and hints. The mind's response to it will be highly individual in consequence. Um, I just want to point out one thing about this quotation. Um, he is taking the high individuality as a consequence of um, the theory directing the mind by analogies and hints. Okay, so there is this notion that we don't have a set of rules that govern the extension of a theory or the transition from you for fertility, um, and that there is an idiosyncratic aspect to it. So it depends very crucially on the creativity of the individual scientist. Okay, so as you can imagine, there are some common criticisms of this view. Um, actually, these common criticisms are not ones that I think that McMullen would disagree with, so I'm not, I think they missed the mark a little bit in terms of being criticisms of McMullen. Uh, so Nolan on new fertility says, um, you know, much room for improvement is a high praise on the report part of the theory. And of course, McMullen <coughs> agrees that new fertile theories have an uncertain epistemic status. So he would say, you're absolutely right. It's not. Um, and then we have from Brady, this is perhaps the most representative um, criticism. Without a clear notion of what uh, this notion of metaphorical extension means, the thesis borders on the vacuous. As far as I can see, we nowhere find a clear statement of Lincoln Mullen's concept of metaphor. This is not surprising, since the concept of metaphor is notoriously difficult to bring in down. The prognosis seems far from right. 
Um, again, I think we call it, we'd say that it's actually in the nature of the transition from infertility to infertility that you can't give anything other than a vague account. To give a precise account would actually be to misrepresent the process. Um, I'm going to say something different than that, rather than yes, I agree. Um, so this, here we get my thesis. I want to make two points. Um, the first is to Brady and also to McMullen. Uh, it really depends on what your theory of metaphor is, whether or not you can say something relatively precise or whether you, you can't say anything at all. And uh, well, Brady does say that the literature on metaphor is um, has controversies. As far as I can tell, the controversies don't run any deeper than in any other area of philosophy. And I'm pretty sure that Brady would not want to say something like any thesis that depends on some area of philosophy is so vague as to border on vacuous. Um, I have a friend in sociology who might <laughs> agree to that <laughs> and accuses me of vacuousness on a regular basis. But for those who are perhaps more sympathetic to the discipline of philosophy, uh, we wouldn't want to say that. My second thesis is more directly to McMullen, and that is that we actually can say something about the evidential significance of new fertile theories. Now, I chose my words relatively carefully here. Evidential significance is not the same thing as it has already been confirmed. So, um, there are things that we're interested in other than whether or not a theory has already been confirmed, whether or not it's going to be accurate. And I want to highlight that a little bit later on in the talk. Okay. So, let's start talking about metaphors. I wrote my master's thesis on metaphor a long time ago, and I'm pretty sure that most of what it said was wrong, uh, but I think this, the unwritten subtitle of my master's thesis was, Why, why Donald Davidson is the Devil? Um, so I'm pretty sure that's what I saw. And I, I saw myself as kind of a you know, David versus Goliath. Um, anyways, here's, um, Davidson gives us one account of metaphors, and here's a quotation from the first page of is what metaphors mean very influential, and actually now, on, on reflection and actually rereading, I think he has a lot more to say that I find interesting. But if you look at a quotation like this, there are no instructions for devising metaphors, there's no manual for determining what a metaphor means or says, there is no test for metaphor that does not call for taste. Uh, if this is your going theory of metaphor, then it's easy to see why, uh, if you fertility depends on metaphorical extensions, why there's really nothing more to say. Um, there are, however, other theories of metaphors out there. Um, so, for example, we have an error and paraphrase account. Um, basically, the way this works is you encounter a metaphor, say, Juliet is the sun, and you your first move is to interpret it literally, and then you realize, well, Juliet's a girl, and the sun is a huge brain full of gas, and Juliet can't be the sun. So they must have meant something else, right, based on the principle of charity. And then you then you do some problem solving activity to try and figure out what Romeo must have meant. Okay. And the paraphrase that you give afterwards, which maybe would be something like Juliet is really important to Romeo, that's going to be the meaning of the metaphor. Uh, you can draw out the meaning of that quite a bit more, by the way, and, and you can draw it out in such a way that it actually makes sense of the story, like why there would be suicide at the end. Uh, because you can't live without the sun. Um, but uh, in any case, that's, once you get a complete paraphrase, you'll just have a bunch of literal sentences, and those act in the way that any other sentence, uh, unproblematic sentence, like the cat is on the map, does. And so there's no difficulty with metaphor. Uh, we also have transference accounts. Some people who are transference theorists are also error and paraphrase theorists. In other words, how do we explain the paraphrase? Well, we explain it via some notion of transcripts, and some are not. Um, they, they also differ in terms of what gets transferred. So when you have a metaphor, to use Black's example, like man is a wolf, uh, you have the source domain, namely the domain of ideas about wolves, and they get transported or transferred into the target domain uh, of, of thinking about man, and they organize it, right? or they, they carry over um, stereotypes. So if your stereotypes of wolves are that they are predatory and, and vicious and so on, then 
what we're going to um, go and transfer those stereotypes to our thinking about man. Um, Kite has a different view of this. She thinks that what gets transferred um, is primarily structure. So um, words get their meaning from their position within the semantic field. Uh, semantic field is going to have uh, two main parts to it. It's going to have a content domain. So um, a content domain determines what sorts of objects or processes, etc., that we're picking out of the world. They can be general, like um, uh, the content domain of all the things that one can possibly experience. Or it can be really specific, like my favorite ice cream flavors. And uh, of course, content domains will overlap in various ways um, and have relationships between them. And these content domains themselves will be organized by what she calls a lexical field. Uh, these are a variety of different kinds of relationships. Just to give you a couple of examples, words can be related to each other by being opposites, black, white, or they can be related to each other in terms of uh, being basic terms versus peripheral terms. So with colors, uh, basic terms, blue, red, yellow, peripheral terms, you know, puce, chartreuse, aquamarine, and so on. Uh, you can have rank orderings, so corporal is higher than private. You can have cyclical orderings, so spring comes before summer, and so on and so forth. There are lots and lots and lots of different ways of organizing these fields. And when you go and offer a metaphor, uh, what you, what you, one of the things you're going to do is you're going to transfer over the relations from the source domain to the target domain. So if I say you're the captain of my heart, um, what I'm, I'm doing is transferring over a rank ordering, and I'm saying you're basically in charge of my emotions, or something like that. So um, now Kate talks about how one of the things that we do is we, we will often make this transference when we have a relatively unformed content domain, um, or unstructured content domain. So when we first started learning about electricity, we used a lot of information from the domain of fluids in order to oops, organize our concepts of electricity. And this shows up in our now literal language, like electric current, draining, and flooding batteries, and so on. OK, now if you read Kate, you'll see that she actually gets really, really specific at times. And specific enough that, that you think, well, I wonder if I could actually come up with a, a computer that might be able to um, represent these various transfers of relationships. And something like this has been done by James Martin, although the, um, the application is a little bit more prosaic. Uh, he's been working on coming up with a, a helpful help program for your computer. And <laughs> One of the problems is if you don't know the name of what it is that you're wanting to do, then you can't find it in your help program. And usually that's what you want to know. If you already knew the name of it, then you can find it in the menu. Um, and so just to take a really simple example, if the word for um, you know, opening a program is um, execute, and the word for closing a program is um, quit, but you don't know those words, and you're going to have a hard time. In fact, you might type in something like, how do I enter this program? How do I exit this program? Uh, those are pretty standard conventional metaphors. They're spatial metaphors that are applied to programs. Uh, they're so conventional as to be near dead. But um, in any case, if we look at conventional metaphors, we'll see that there are certain metaphors that are used very frequently in a lot of different domains. So in other words, there's a source domain that tends to be very common to a lot of different domains. Uh, Johnson has, or sorry, Martin has relied pretty heavily on the work of Blake and Johnson on um, conventional metaphors. Um, but again, I think you can take this as a, for instance, uh, these are sociolinguistic studies of uh, what sorts of metaphors organize our ordinary ways of talking. So I'll move on to conventional metaphors from Lake and Johnson. Here are some examples. Uh, X's of building, right? We use building metaphors to organize a lot of um, things. X is vision related, there are a lot of vision metaphors, war metaphors, journey metaphors, fluid, plant, machine. Uh, these are just, if, if, you, if you just start observing the way that you talk, you'll notice that these metaphors come up over and over again. 
So here are just some specific examples. So if you think of theories or arguments as buildings, then you can say things like the foundation of a theory or its framework, um, a shaky or solid argument, constructing, deconstructing, so on and so forth. Um, ideas are commodities, that idea won't sell. Um, often we talk about ideas as procreation, so Locke is the father of classical liberalism or cognitive psychology is still in its infancy. Okay. Um, it's actually important to give an answer to the question. There, there are certain metaphors that we pick more often than others. Uh, we don't actually have to give a very deep question, but if we're going to program them in, we have to know what ones they are, uh, so we have to have an idea of where to look for them. Uh, some people argue that we pick them on the basis of familiarity. So one of the first things that we do in life is we learn how to orient ourselves in space, which is why spatial metaphors are very common. Uh, I don't think we have to give um, some sort of evolutionary account um, or evolutionary story of why these metaphors rather than some other, uh, partly because I think if you look at different people, you might find that, or, or different uh, cultures, different time periods, that different metaphors figure prominently. Uh, I'm not going to talk right now about a different culture, I'm going to talk about a different person. This is my favorite example of a metaphor user. Um, I just couldn't help myself. So if you um, look at Kepler, there's tons of metaphors and analogies uh, throughout his work. And one of the things that he believes is that God created the universe in order to instantiate certain um, types of laws that have aesthetic properties. And by looking at these aesthetic properties, we can um, see them as truth markers. Right? In other words, God would create something like this that makes this uh, law a plausible candidate for being true. Uh, the laws in mechanics have the right sort of truth markers attached to them, so they're, they're likely true. And since God would want to replicate these aesthetic pleasing relationships in as many domains as possible, this actually goes and justifies uh, the transfer of the laws and methods of mechanics from mechanics, which then was the study of machines, over to celestial physics and to optics as well. So my point here is that we actually are going to, if we're going to set up a psychologically realistic uh, model, we're going to have to look at the actual conventional uh, metaphors that we use. Uh, we, we can't tell a story about uh, you know, why some metaphors are, say, necessary. Okay? They're not necessarily necessary. Okay, so how might we go about modeling these computers? Well, there's a couple different strategies. Uh, one is the word sense strategy. The basic idea here is we treat these metaphors as dead metaphors, therefore as literal, and so we just simply supply the dictionary definitions to the computer. So uh, X of the program is going to be given uh, a meaning. Uh, namely to, uh, to quit the program. There are two related problems that uh, Martin has with this particular approach. One has to do with uh, programming, pro sorry, programming economy. The economy is generally seen as a virtue in, in cognitive science. And um, if you have to go and add a different meaning for every use of enter, since, since spatial metaphors are used so frequently, there's going to be an awful lot of different meanings for words like enter or exit or into or out of and so on. So you're gonna have to add perhaps too many entries. Uh, more significantly, you're actually going to lose the connections between the entry entries and the inferences that it allows you to make. So let's suppose that you're familiar with the definition of enter as in, uh, how do I enter this program? But you haven't encountered the definition of exit. You can actually go and infer what exit must mean based on the, uh, the spatial metaphor that's used. Okay, so um, if you go this route, you actually lose those connections, or those connections have to somehow show up in the dictionary. Okay, there's another strategy. One, uh, this is based on the error and paraphrase account of metaphor. So the computer encounters uh, a metaphor, Juliet is the sun, and then it has 
um, criteria for evaluating this. And one of the things that the computer notices is that um, Juliet is classified as a girl, and girls are classified as things that are not sons. And so then it realizes that this can't have been intended literally. And so then a problem uh, solving task, a uh, problem solving engine is brought in to handle this. Now there's some psycholog uh, psycholinguistic data that suggests that this isn't the route that we want to go. Um, in particular, uh, they've done some tests where people are presented with uh, literal sentences, metaphorical sentences, and if uh, they don't differ too much in terms of complexity, and we'll leave that whole can of worms alone as to whether or not we can actually say that these don't differ in terms of complexity. Uh, but it actually doesn't take subjects longer to compute the metaphorical sentences than the literal ones, which suggests that there may not be an extra task that they uh, that they engage in. Uh, the other thing is that in in a lot of different contexts, we may go for the literal, or, sorry, the metaphorical meaning first. So if I say I ran into a pole, um, and you might be concerned about the car once you've asked to ascertain that I'm okay, and then I say no, I actually was jogging and I literally ran into the car. So um, this idea that we have to assume that it's a literal meaning first and then only go to a metaphorical meaning when the literal meaning doesn't make sense doesn't seem to be correct. Okay, so what does Martin have proposed instead? Um, he's got a program that he calls Minus, and um, what the way this works is the conventional metaphors, once identified, are actually programmed in. And, um, Another feature of Midas is that it doesn't actually give preference to literal interpretation. It actually goes and searches for all possible coherent interpretations, and then it'll have a variety of candidates left over. If there's only one, then we're good. If there's several, then perhaps some sort of context machine is going to have to be brought in. But no preference is being given to the literal. Uh, and so it finds metaphorical meanings even when a coherent literal one is available. The example that Martin gives is Again, we killed Connors. So uh, we're talking about tennis players, and one would expect that what this means is that again, we bested Connors in a tennis match. And then, of course, you'd say, no, no, actually, he stabbed him with the knife. So <laughs> that's a case where we go for the. Um, so both are actually coherent from Midas's perspective, because uh, Midas is aware of the, the metaphorical meaning of kill, and since they are both uh, tennis players. Those are people who, tennis players are people who participate in sporting events. Sporting events are cases where people can be, you know, killed in that metaphorical sense, therefore it makes sense. Uh, but also McEnroe's and Connors are um, animates, and animates can play the role of Killer and Kelly. So uh, both of the, those, those um, interpretations are coherent. And that's, of course, when the context gets brought in. But that's true for us as well. Okay, um, here are some principles. There's a lot. I'm just going to summarize for reasons of time. We started a little late. Okay, um, the words are going to be defined in such a way that they're going to have relationships to each other. He talks about core relationships where um, have and give are core related to each other because it refers to the possession of an object. He gives more details on how that works, but we don't have time for it. Now, when a metaphorical transference is, um, occurs, the core relationships with the target domain are going to be transferred over to the source domain. Okay, and core relationships are used to make inferences and allow synonym substitutions. So if, um, if you can exit a program, you can leave a program. So those are going to be defined in such a way in the um, space point domain to be core related. Here's what I find most interesting about Midas. It can handle certain kinds of uh, novel situations. So if you haven't programmed in this use of kill and how can I kill this program into Midas, what it's going to do is, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to look for similar metaphors. Similarity is going to be determined, or it's going to be defined by uh, matchings of core relationships. So um, for example, it's going to look for known metaphors and inferences that are correlated to kill a program. So here we have um, a process is a living thing, termination is death, 
um, and these are correlated in a known metaphor, namely to kill a conversation. And then if you look at programs, programs are also defined as processes that can be terminated. And so because of these similarity relationships, they're judged similar to conversations. And so killing a program is then interpreted as uh, terminating a program, which is interpreted as exit, um, exiting a program. Uh, Midas also uses two other routes. We can extend the core, right? So if I can exit the program, I can enter it. And also some combination of one and two. Okay, so if we bring this back to youth fertility, one way we could interpret youth fertility is that it's going to depend on the richness of a system of core relationships in the source domain. And then the relationship between youth fertility and deep fertility is going to be based on whether or not we can trace the development through building up novel metaphors um, through this particular process. Um, this comment is kind of a free association comment, and I'm actually going to skip it for reasons of time. Um, there's some things that Midas doesn't tell us. There's actually a lot of things that Midas doesn't tell us. Um, the first is that because it's obviously very sensitive to the programmer's choices, even those choices that are based on sociolinguistic studies, um, we don't actually get an explanation of our similarity judgments. Those are actually given by Programmer, so the program itself doesn't tell us about that. Uh, Midas has also been tested only in very limited types of cases, and of course, we're interested in new fertility, so that's going to involve more complicated cases. Martin thinks that his program is extendable, but uh, more work needs to be done on that. Uh, also, for our purposes, we would need to modify Midas to handle novel analogies. And what I have in mind is something like this. Okay, so if we use a Keplerian analogy, creative force is like light, is like um, the motive force that moves the planets around. Um, we can obviously define the core relationships in the right sort of way so that the computer can understand sentences about motive force. So um, I've gone and given sentences about light, light is a process that emanates circular circularly, light spreads out straight lines, light spreads out evenly. The motive force is a process that emanates circularly from a central body, therefore it spreads out the security lines, it spreads out evenly. Now we don't really, we're not that interested in figuring out what these sentences mean. We're actually interested in figuring out whether or not we can make these inferences. So that's why I'm going to be shifting our discussion to analogies. Okay, you can't talk about analogies without talking about Hesse. Um, and Keynes, uh, Hesse did some really uh, important work on the use of metaphors and analogies in science. And we're going to have a few more distinctions. So when you look at the relationship between source and target domains, you're going to notion you're going to notice that some relationships transfer over and some don't. And then there's some where we don't know whether or not they should transfer over. So apples are red and round, and they're good to eat. Balls are red and round, they're not good to eat. Um, there's a relationship that doesn't transfer over. The relationships that don't transfer over are what um, is referred to as a negative analogy. The ones that do transfer over are positive analogies, and the neutral analogy refers to those areas where we don't know. So for McMullen, U fertility takes place in the domain of neutral analogies. Okay, another distinction. We have to look at horizontal versus vertical relationships. So if we're going and draw an analogy between um, water flow and heat flow, where pressure causes water flow and temperature causes heat flow, the relationships within a domain are um, the vertical relationships, and the relationship between domains are referred to as the horizontal relationships. This is going to become important later on. Okay. So here's, we need to talk about what makes an analogy fertile uh, versus one that's not. And uh, Gettler has a proposal. She says some of these scientific analogies have suggested deep research, while others have merely provided a kind of spurious feeling of comfort. Now she's got a way of distinguishing between these two. So here's her proposal. We'll see if we agree with it. The first thing we need to consider is the 
um, source specificity. So if, for example, you're going to try and explain magnetic attraction in terms of romantic attraction, given that we don't know very much about romantic attraction and how it works, that's not going to help us in terms of understanding uh, magnetic attraction. So we need to have specific knowledge about our base or our source domain. Um, second has to do with how clearly or how well uh, our information from the source domain maps onto the target domain. So we have to look at the horizontal relationships. Um, we also need to look at the rich, which is called the richness. This is the number of attributes mapped. Uh, this isn't going to turn out to be very important in terms of the fertility of theories because Kendrick thinks that with a good analogy, you aren't actually going to map that many attributes. Okay? What you're going to, in fact, when you map a lot of attributes, what you're looking at really is a is literal comparison rather than an analogy. Uh, but you still need to consider it. Um, what she does emphasize is the systematicity of vertical relationships. So are there a lot of relationships between um, the various components of the source domain? What is the nature of those relationships? Um, are they intricate um, and systematically connected up? The, the more systematicity the source domain has, the better um, analogy it's going to actually provide. Okay, so uh, standard example of fertile analogy, Rutherford solar, solar System model of the hydrogen atom. This quotation is at the very bottom of your handout. Um, I'm going to leave it for you to have a look at since I'm running short on time. Okay, so Gettner has proposed a, uh, an engine, a structure matching engine, or SME. And the way that SME works is it maps the structure from the source domain to the target domain. So um, we're going to use a usual sort of calculus for representing to the computer what's actually going on in a, a physical system. So we have entities, relations, and attributes, um, and functions. We're going to ignore functions. If you look at the back of your handout, um, you'll see that we have a physical situation. We have um, a large beaker of water, and then we have a small bottle of water that are connected up. And we also have a cup of hot coffee or warm coffee. And on a silver bar at the top, we also have an ice cube. And the analogy in question here is that we're going to argue that the greater pressure is going to cause water flow, and the greater heat is going to cause temperature flow. So that's the analogy. Now, if we look at if we ignore the attributes, so there are various features that we're going to ignore. We're going to ignore the fact that the water and the coffee are both flat topped and shiny. Okay, so um, those aren't very important. Instead, we're going to focus on relationships. If you look at the, uh, the bottom right hand corner where we have a representation of the two situations, um, we're going to actually focus on the relationships which are indicated by the diagonal lines. So we have a we have relationships of greater than. We also have a higher order in, uh, relationship of causation. So the greater pressure causes the flow of the water. And Gettner's SME is going to prefer transferring over relationships that are embedded in a larger system of relationships. Okay. So it's going to notice that we've got a connection between the greater pressure and the greater temperature, namely the matching relationship of greaterness, and we're going to transfer that over along with the causal relationships. There are questions that you probably have about that. I think we'll reserve that for the question period. There are questions that a lot of people have about that. Um, one question is just to be, well, why why would we transfer relationships just because they're more systematic? Um, and another question is, given the way that this is represented, uh, Gettner can represent it in such a way so that we're going to get the right analogy for three. Okay, so this is a criticism given by uh, Bartha, Brontes, and, and pretty much everyone else. So the mapping is predetermined by programmers' choices. Um, another question is that uh, some potentially successful structures get transferred, others don't. So, for example, you can catch a cold from someone, but they don't throw you a cold. Okay, so, this is a relationship that does not get transferred over. 
And so we actually have to look at conventions of um, transfers in order to be able to answer that question. We have to look at something other than just its place in a systematic relationship. Okay. Um, here's, here's why we're doing this. Now, Gettner and Martin are trying to come up with a psychologically realistic uh, model of metaphorical and analogical reasoning. Um, I don't think it's necessary to say that they've completed their job. In fact, it's pretty clear that they haven't. I don't think it's necessary to say that they've completed it, or even that it's completable, um, in order to say that we've actually learned something from this in terms of being able to make more precise and call this notion of fertility. Um, one of the things that um, this helps us do, and I, I think George can appreciate this better than I can, uh, is that in the process of actually trying to develop a computer model, you have to get really precise on what your commitments are. And um, that already is a large advantage. Moreover, you can actually run simulations or tests, which gives us an avenue for uh, being able to test some of our assumptions to see whether or not they're going to be stated that's psychologically realistic. And presumably there's going to be um, a feedback loop between uh, results from neuroscience, um, psycholinguistic data, sociolinguistic data, and these test runs. And, um, you know, as, as we articulate more and more, at least what we don't know, um, a certain amount of progress is actually being made. So um, the picture that I want to take a stand against is that will uh, is something like, well, new fertility involves the use of metaphors and analogies. Our responses to these are highly idiosyncratic, so there's nothing more to say. I think there is a fair amount more we can say, even if it's far from complete. Um, but there are, of course, problems. One is, suppose we come up with a completely psychologically realistic model, that only gives us a possible account. It doesn't give us an actual account of, you know, this is in fact how the brain, you know, how we're actually doing it. Um, and it certainly can't be used to predict um, accidental developments. So when you when you look at scientific fertility, uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, uh, things that we couldn't have known were going to happen in the laboratory. So mold grew in the petri dish. That's not something that can be explained by any of the foregoing. Um, I do think that that's actually a different notion of fertility than what McMullen has in mind. McMullen is talking about plausible extensions of a theory. He's not talking about what we do with a theory when something new comes off. It's <coughs> not the kind of fertility that I'm focusing on here. Um, but most importantly, even if we come up with a completely psychologically realistic model, that doesn't give us a normative account. And we want to know whether or not we ought to make those inferences, not whether or not, not just whether or not we do. And now I'm just going to close with a few comments about that. So Gettner thinks that we actually ought to prefer um, analogies with highly systematic relationships in the source domain then get transferred over to the target domain. Um, I'll get to that in just a second. She also thinks that we need to look at validity. Just to comment, uh, Gettner is not using the word validity in the way that a logician would. What she means is that he has given us a test and the theory has uh, the test has been successful. So, but validity, of course, belongs to p-fertility, and we are looking at the relationship between p-fertility and p-fertility in how we make the transition. So we're going to focus on systematicity. Is that something that can belong to new fertility? Uh, Paul Bartha, hot off the press, uh, Oxford 2010, has just published a book called By Parallel Reasoning which um, gives a really nice extended treatment of how we can evaluate uh, arguments by analogy. It's considerably more sophisticated than your, your average um, textbook on logic, which gives you some, some rules of thumb and some basic advice. Um, I just thought it. I haven't had a chance to fully, fully digest it, but um, in any case, first comment on that, there is quite a bit that we can say 
about how to determine when, when our analogies are likely to be profitable. Um, and he says it. But I'm going to focus on um, criticism that he makes of Gettner. And this is, um, so Gettner's proposal is that we should look at the systematicity of the theory, and that's going to tell us whether or not we ought to make the inference. Martha points out, rightly, that systematicity is not the same thing as plausibility. You can have a systematic system, uh, um, <coughs> system of relationships, but of course it doesn't mean that they're true. Okay? Um, I think this is absolutely correct, but I don't think that it takes us to the conclusion that Bartha wants us to draw, which is namely that systematicity is not going to belong in our normal theory of analogies. So, um, Here's, here's an argument that I think we should actually check. So systematicity doesn't give us plausibility, therefore systematicity doesn't play an important role in our assessment of youth fertility. And in order to make this case, I want to draw an analogy between the systematicity is not plausibility um, and another argument in unification of simplicity is not the same as truth. And again, I agree that if you have a theory with unifying power or a theory that is simple in the right sort of way, that doesn't mean that the theory is actually true, okay? that, or even more likely to be true or anything like that. It, it may well be the case that the world is complex. However, if we're interested in testability instead of just truth, then we are actually going to be interested in the right sort of unification or simplicity and we are going to be interested in the right sort of systematicity. In particular, <coughs> uh, this is going to allow us to access the world in a way so that we can test our theory to find out whether or not it's going to test successfully. Okay, and if the source domain has the right sort of systematicity, if in fact the source domain contains systematic dependencies, those might be transferable. So I'm not, by the way, saying that this is the only way that a theory can come by having systematic dependencies. What I am saying is that this is one way that we can actually uh, construct a theory so that it's going to have systematic dependencies, which we want to have in our theory. But I actually think that there is uh, a slightly deeper connection between systematic dependencies and new fertility. And it goes something like this. So, Part of the value of systematic dependencies is that they allow us to um, make the observations more informative. Okay? And they actually allow us to access certain kinds of information and access certain kinds of predictions in a way that we might not be able to otherwise. Okay? And here's my intuition. If you have um, a theory that is really extendable, extendable to a certain amount, uh, but it doesn't contain any systematic dependencies, then it's actually going to be less U-fertile than a theory that's equally extendable but has um, systematic dependencies in it because presumably fertility is going to have something to do with whether or not a theory increases our chances of getting information about the world. So um, I do think that there is a connection between systematic And this is all based on this notion that we want to make our observations informative, and fertility is an important component of that. Okay, I'm going to close because I've run over time. And um, <coughs> if that wasn't clear, then we now have an opportunity to make that clear. Okay, we have about 20 minutes for questions, and what I'll do is I'll keep it to you in the order I see hands. If you have a comment or a footnote to add to a current discussion, then raise a finger and I'll let that was the guy who jumped the queue, but it's a new question, raise a hand, and George. Uh, I want to propose an example for you to study closely. You brought it up, electric current. Um, both heat flow and the flow of electricity date from the late 18th century, as far as I know, and they really have nothing more and cap the flow of caloric being measured by the Lavoisier Laplace calorimeter and in the Franklin, et cetera, one fluid or two fluid. But the first time we had controlled electric current 
was in 1800 when Volta announced the battery. Now there are several things very interesting about this. I'll just list them to tell you why I think it's an especially useful example to observe. To consider. First of all, because nobody's ever observed electric current itself. And the best way to demonstrate that is it took a century to realize which direction it was going. Uh, but the more striking thing is since, 18, since 1840s, we've always measured it using an electromagnet, what's called a galvanometer. Now that word was introduced in Ampere's classic paper on electrodynamics by Ampere telling you this is the way to measure electric current, not the way we have been doing it, by the displacement of the electromagnet. So I, I, I like to give this question, I'll do it, what I always do with students. How in the world did Ampere discover his law, which is a law relating electric current and electric field, which is a force field around it, if he had no way to measure current? How did he measure current? Anybody know? It's a fascinating answer. The number of voltaic cells. That was the sole way of measuring current until the 1830s. And of course it's a terrible way and it gives you no sense of flow at all. So something very funny is going on with the notion of electric current that doesn't really get resolved more or less till Bohr's uh, doctoral dissertation where he's proposing something to the electrons flowing through a conductor. And even that doesn't get worked out till the 1930s. But I just propose it as a particularly good example to play off of the two here because I think they work very different from one another, and I think the electrical one's going to show you a lot of things going on. Thank you. I don't actually have a response to that. No, I, I was proposing it for you even more thought. I don't, if you haven't looked at the history, I don't see why you should have. Uh, I really like your beaker uh, and coffee cup example. Um, and I think, you know, I, I agree with you that these analogies can lead one towards building a new theory that can direct you, you know, in important ways. But my question is about what role these analogies can play, if any, in, in things like confirmation. So, for example, if, you know, imagine that I was talking about, I had reason to think that some other system which I had very little empirical access to, you know, obeyed similar laws to these two systems. Well, basically, it's a thermodynamic system, like a black hole or something. Could I do experiments on these beakers and draw conclusions from those experiments uh, for those inex you know, empirically inaccessible things just on the basis of these analogies. So how, how far can I take this in terms of confirmation? Um, well, the answer is going to be it depends. Well, two parts. Uh, it depends and um, not all the way. So um, one of the things that we're going to need to look at is not just how, how well we know the source domain, but how reasonable um, are the inferences, how, how reasonable are the connections between the source and the target domain. So if we already have really good reason to think that um, uh, the source and the target are uh, not just related uh, analogously, but perhaps related so closely that they are very likely the same kind of thing, or, or close to the same kind of thing, then, uh, then we can go and make tests in, in one kind of case and that can give us some confidence to a certain level in the other kind of case. I mean, it's not the same thing as actually testing directly. Okay. So um, standard case of uh, uh, rat studies for medical research, that's a case where we use an analogy between rat physiology and human physiology in order to determine the effects. Um, if we had um, something even closer to human physiology, a creature even closer, so close that it's very then we would definitely increase our confidence in terms of the test if we could test humans. So if, for example, okay, uh, pregnant women aren't allowed to take any drugs at all because nobody ever tests pregnant women. I mean, that, by the way, those are um, uh, both hyperbolic statements. But um, if you, uh, for example, if uh, if a per person under a certain kind of condition was extremely close to being like a pregnant woman. Uh, but not actually pregnant, such that we were willing to do that. <laughs> uh, you know, then then uh, one might be able to draw further inferences about whether or not that particular drug is safe. So, uh, but, but yeah, it, it depends 
two things, how well we know, say, the, the vertical relations in the source domain, but then more importantly, how strongly are the connections. The other thing you need to look at is, if you look at the system of relationships, um, and you have, in the vertical relationships, maybe you have a causal inference. So uh, we know P, Q, and, and R, and we know that if we have P, Q, and R, that we can then infer S. Okay? Uh, and if in our target domain, we have P, and we've tested it, and it seems to be the right sort of P, the same sort of P, and we've got Q, uh, and we've got R, and we tested that, and we seem to have the right sort of Q and R, then uh, we get a more confidence in S than if we're, say, uncertain of this. Or, uh, I mean, there are other complexities that we have to think about, like, uh, we get P, Q, and R giving us S unless T, and we're not sure, sure about the status of T in our target domain. So, uh, an example, we're trying to figure out whether or not Mars could have supported life at some point in time. Uh, and we draw an analogy between Mars and Earth. We're going to have to take into account, um, you know, life can, so here's a bad analogy. Uh, Life can happen on a planet, the Earth is a planet, Mars is a planet, therefore life can happen on Mars. There are a variety of things that can interfere with the production of life, and we need to look at whether or not Mars has those interfering <coughs> features. Uh, and the list goes on. There's actually a fair amount that one cannot say about this. I just want to add a little bit to that. Um, I think that's exactly the right kind of answer to give. We have to have good reason to believe that the systems are like each other in the right side of the way. Um, the way you put it is are the same sort of thing, but I would... Well, that would be the ideal. Well, right. not necessarily, mm -hmm. um, because it could be very different things, the sorts of things if they have the right kind of strict structural similarities, which is um, the case for the example that Brian and I, and I are actually thinking about. Brian, do you want to tell, tell us why you asked that question? <laughs> okay. Wayne and I went to a talk, saw a very interesting talk last weekend about black hole thermodynamics. So if you have exactly this problem, you know, I, I just described it as, you know, tightly related to the kind of talk you're giving right now, you know, in which basically people are doing experiments on water systems in order to learn about Hawking radiation of black holes. And the question is, you know, are you really learning about black holes when you're doing these experiments with water? Because there's a, there's a structural analysis, analogy in the equations in the physics between hydrodynamics and black hole thermodynamics, and there are the, the hydrodynamics equivalent of a black hole is what, what um, Bill Under calls a cell hole, where the rate of flow of water is actually faster than the speed of sound, so sound can't get out of it. And Bill really is, he is, he is doing experiments with water tanks to find out about what black holes do. <laughs> um, um, Dylan was next, I think. I can ask uh, the, the not quite as thoughtful question, because I haven't finished thinking about my thoughtful question. Um, just, I mean, to, to some extent, is McMullen trying to maybe not consciously ruin the idea of U fertility? Is he trying to ruin, to ruin it? Like to say, like, I mean, because in some of his works, he's got this idea of like really promoting hypothetical deductive methodologies and means to show we can be as creative as we want and produce meaningful and good scientific things. So, I mean, is part of what he's doing trying to undermine this idea that U fertility is something? Uh, valuable? Um, not in this paper. I mean, the purpose of this paper, there, there are two. Um, one is uh, one is, is to argue that uh, logical empiricists can't account for scientific reasoning, which includes um, uh, more than just uh, figuring out the logical resources of the theory. Right. So, so he's actually really concerned to show that uh, one can't go and articulate any kind of metaphor analogy by talking about the logical resources. Um, and uh, the other purpose, and this is one that I don't really have my head fully around, um, he, he, he wants to use uh, uh, U and P fertility to give an argument for realism. That if uh, something like, if, I'm, I'm going to give a really, I don't, I don't even want to give this version of the argument, it's so bugs money. Um, but uh, uh, if a theory evolves successfully, then it's somehow fit for survival. It somehow latches onto the world. You need some kind of uh, world theory relationship in order to be able to explain the success 
process of its evolution. Um, and let's see, ruin the notion of infertility. Maybe, can you say more about what you mean by ruin? Well, because he definitely wants to get in there and he wants there to be a relationship between you and infertility so that he can deny this view that all we have are logical resources. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of some of his later stuff where he talks about hypothetical structuralism or something where he's trying to develop the idea that we have rich uh, theoretical structure that we confront with uh, with reality and um, or experiment, and, but it is nonetheless we're it's still HD, and that's and and I mean he criticizes Newton as he thinks Newton is just presuming more of the same. We really need this with this idea of just plain old HB to allow us to have this, you know, this confrontation of new stuff, novel stuff. Right? Um, I just want—I mean, uh, I mean, part of the thoughtful question I wasn't able to articulate is that, that focusing on, on McMullen like this, or starting from McMullen, uh, puts you fertility in the wrong kind of frame. And I think that maybe the idea of this could be fertility but better thought of as not something like this, but um, as explaining what it means for a theory to, to be extendable. Or to, to, sorry, to, to uh, I'll ask you about this later. <laughs> um, I mean, if, if what you're saying is why am I going and connecting this to evidential support when really it belongs in a different place, is that? I think it was evidence of support, but I don't. I think I'm, I'm worried about starting with Mick McMullen. I think I, I'm worried that he's framing it this wrong kind of way. But maybe I'll help that myself. That's yeah. That's entirely possible. Was that a hand or a finger? It, it's a it, 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 it's a finger from the question before. It okay. Takes a while to figure out. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, so okay. it's not a okay. Uh, I I think that the I'd like to. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, there's a, uh, a lot of work going on with looking at vitamin D and uh, uh, certain kinds of things it's good for. And uh, now, uh, I know somebody that's working on uh, testing for uh, side effects for the various drugs. And it turns out that when they give this vitamin D compound for rats, the rats die. And it turns out vitamin D was actually used as a rat poison in earlier, I mean, actually. And so they're having a great deal of trouble getting uh, people to take seriously this vitamin D thing for humans, which has all kinds of good effects. Because man, they give the rats that just die. And they've started to do uh, work with uh, a kind of monkey which is much closer to humans. And it turns out that the, uh, uh, to get this particular bad effect that kills the rat to go on, to, to happen in a monkey, you would need like thousands and thousands of times the, the dose that would do it for a rat. And they're trying very hard to get this effect with the monkey to be able to be taken by, I think it's, by whatever, drug regime that would allow this thing. Uh, and now, can you use, I mean, the, the, presumably the monkey is closer to humans, and so the fact that you don't get that effect, that the amount you would need would be so much higher than the things that, is this the sort of thing, it seems to me this is, this is sort of a little bit like, like George's question, but it, case where you, I mean, how to put it, the, the monkeys are more like humans in a relevant way, mm -hmm. that you should be able to allow this to offset the, the bad stuff that's coming into that. So. I think that, I mean, that reveals one of the ways in which analogies are very vulnerable um, in, in that, um, so this, say something like this, unless T, uh, we, we may not find out about it. There, there, there may be a mystery on the lost team. 
that's taking place. So in, in, in the case of the rats, there's some way in which they're different that we didn't know until testing the vitamin D. And then we find out that the monkeys are similar in that respect, right? Um, and in order to test the, like the, I guess the horizontal relationship of in that respect, that's actually a matter where you're going to have to test. And I think in that, in that place, um, uh, peak fertility is actually going to be crucial. And you fertil I'm not conceiving of you fertility as something that tells us what is more likely to be confirmed. Okay? When, I, when I go and I, I connect it to um, our notion of evidence, what I'm connecting it to is something more like its testability rather than how successful it's going to be afterwards. Um, so, so yeah, that's, I mean, I, thank you for the example, that's a good one. That's going to be a case where um, you are going to be crucially dependent on after-the-fact tests or information after-the-fact. Now, okay. I'm struck by your, your the, the example you cited where it was found that cognitively, apparently, human beings take about as much time, as much effort to process metaphor and literal uh, statements. And it struck me that maybe human beings always always process uh, uh, language metaphorically it's a sort of metaphorical mode in the same way that we are always we, our memories work associatively or see work associatively rather than indexically like the computers would and do you think that, that might be true and that, that might help figure out how we think about scientific theory? Right. Um, so do I think that might be true? Okay, the first of all, the, the absolute honest answer to, to that is going to be, I don't know, and it's going to depend. Yeah. Um, there, there are going to be certain cases where we might more naturally um, think metaphorically first. Uh, they might be cases where we are feeling very uncertain. I mean, what you're talking about opens up a massive can of worms, so we would need to answer questions like, um, when do metaphors die, for example? So in order to look at the psycholinguistic research, did they actually offer a metaphor? <coughs> To the subject, or was it, you know, if it's going to be an ordinary metaphor? Because, I mean, if you offer to the subject something like, uh, this is T.S. Eliot's uh, Pilaf, like the irresponsible fetus, uh, it will take everybody an infinite amount of time to be able to interpret that sentence. So, um, you know, we are going to have to consider the kinds of examples that are being used. Um, there's a fair amount of work being done right now. Um, a lot of interesting books that I just got on my bookshelf that I haven't had a chance to read because they arrived you know, a few days before I left to come here, uh, about uh, how we think metaphorically most of the time and that there are levels and level, levels and levels of metaphors and not metaphors that that's, you know, uh, account for our cognitive structure, account for the way that we perceive the world. And I know that Lake and Johnson argued that uh, the kinds of inferences we make, the kinds of things that we pay attention to, the kinds of things that is similar or dissimilar um, depend in part very crucially on the sorts of metaphors that we inherit as being a member of a particular socio-linguistic community. Um, so if that's true, then, um, then one would need to look at that in order to or address the question of scientific creativity. So how, how scientific creativity works, or how, how human creativity in general works. Chris. So uh, let's say we take the point from McMullen to be some, I haven't read the paper, but something like uh, this kind of non-algorithmic process by which scientists extend uh, successful techniques to make this you know, familiar theory to cover new areas. Right? So, um, and you want to have a sort of psychologically realistic, naturalistic account of how that process goes. You assume that it's not just using logical resources of the theory. Um, the basic, there's a question I was sort of, that was bothering me throughout the time. Why I think that that process is going to be similar to the, the analysis of metaphors, which looks like more like a semantic um, concern. So I think maybe, I was initially thinking it would be more like what you're describing towards the end in, in terms of processing analogies. Right. Um, but I, I, so why does McMullen make that initial way of saying that it's a metaphorical um, process that we should see? Well, I'm not sure why McMullen does. Um, I mean, I decided to take McMullen fairly literally. And so when he 
talks about metaphors course analogies, and what I see in our these in fact, as um, you know, um, non-heuristic government, as, as he supposes. Um, he was, uh, this, this article is from the 70s. Uh, Mary Hesse had recently published um, the influential book on metaphors in science. You see, um, I guess a little bit later, Richard Boyd talking about uh, theory constituted metaphors. So there is this idea in the air that um, uh, scientific theories are metaphors and that our job is actually to articulate the interpretation. So if you go with an error and paraphrase account, um, our job is to go and figure out what the paraphrase is and get it as detailed as possible. Once that's done, we're we'll testing the sheet. So I think that was a fairly common, common view. Um, also, uh, I mean, there's this, depending on what theory of metaphor you have, there's a real sense in which metaphors are structurally very similar to analogies. It's just that one's about meaning and the other is about inferences. But if they're both about transference of structures, Yeah, so I mean, um, I'm not a McMullen. Um, uh, right, so, 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 so let me then. So, um, the, the initial thought was that if you're interested in giving a sort of naturalistic account of how certain processes work, it seems that the, the processing of the metaphor at the kind of semantic level, as you're describing a lot of these computer model models is doing, seems quite different than, <coughs> at least on the surface, the kind of transference of inferential structure. That, describing in terms of analogical reasoning. And you're just giving me some ways of seeing how this connected. Mm -hmm. But initially, it wasn't clear to me why the, the cognitive process that is involved in uh, responding to metaphor, metaphors and language would be the same as the one that seemed to be the real focus, namely, how is it that scientists extend what looks like the potential of, you know, how do they realize the potential of the theory? Mm -hmm. um, and why is it that those two processes so I, I think you've given me some reason for seeing them, but I, that was the question. Oh, I see. Well, <coughs> oh, let's thank our